Hello there everybody. Today's true crime video is going to cover one of the more horrific cases that I've ever researched. Sometimes after digging through the details of a case, I'm left thinking, how can it get any worse than this? Well, my friends, I think I have to stop thinking along those lines because just when I think I've heard the worst of the worst, along comes a case that just blows my mind. It's very difficult for me to wrap my brain around the callousness that some people possess. I don't think I will ever fully understand how people can do such horrible horrible things to other people, especially to children. Even though the details are pretty bad in the case that I'm about to talk about, I want to thank you so much for being here and supporting my channel. It really means a lot to me. So with that being said, let's dive right in. This is a case that comes out of Jacksonville, Florida. On June 21st, 2013, a mother named Rain Periwinkle and her three young daughters are getting a few items at a local Dollar General store. It's late in the evening, about 7.30 p.m., and while they're at the store, her eight year old daughter named Sherish sees a dress that she really likes and so she asks her mom if she could have it. Now Rain had been going through a hard time financially and she could only afford to get a few essential items so she had to tell Sherish no. Well an older man named Donald Smith is in the store and he overhears the conversation between mom and daughter. He says out loud if you really want that dress I'll buy it for you. Rain thanks the man but declines his offer. He's standing relatively close to the mother and he says to her you look like you have your hands full. I have a few little ones too so I understand understand. He then walks out of the store and Rain gets in line and pays for the items that she's getting. As she and her girls exit the store, she could see that Don is outside near the parking lot and he says to her, I have a $150 gift card. You look like you could use it more than me. He says he wants to give her the gift card, but the problem is his wife has it. Now if Rain doesn't mind waiting, his wife is going to meet him at the dollar store in just a few minutes and once she gets there, he's going to give Rain the gift card. Now Rain's really happy about this opportunity. It isn't often that someone's going to offer this kind of help and her girls are really in need of some shoes and clothes. Money's been really tight and this would really, really help her out. So she agrees to wait with him. While they're waiting in the parking lot, Rain tells Don that she was initially afraid of him because she thought he was going to rob her. Don starts to speak about his job and he's telling her about the church he attends. Overall, he seems like a decent guy. A half hour goes by and the wife still hasn't arrived. Don then says that his wife is going to meet him at Walmart and he asks her if she would like for him to drive her and her three girls there as Rain does not have a car. She tells Don that she would feel a lot more comfortable with the wife around, so she asks him if they could wait a few more minutes to see if she'll show up. A few minutes go by and Don asks for a second time if she wants the ride. Rain hesitates, not really knowing if this is a good idea or not. Don actually gets irritated with her and he says, you know, you don't have to do this. I guess he could sense that she was unsure or uneasy if she and her girls should get in his van. I mean, after all, he is a stranger. So in an effort to make her feel more comfortable, he says to her, do you want to see my driver's license. He takes his license out and he shows it to her. And then he says, you look like you're trying to save money, right? He develops the attitude of, he's the one offering to help her, so if she doesn't want the help, she should just say so. She thinks it over for a moment and begins to feel guilty about feeling weary of him. All he's seemingly trying to do is help a struggling mother. He seems like a nice guy and he looks like he could be someone's grandfather. She does feel more comfortable after looking at his license. And the possibility of getting her girls these much needed items was very hard to resist, especially for her eight-year-old daughter, Cherish. Rain had a shared custody agreement with Cherish's father. The two of them weren't on the best terms, and both of them were vying for full custody of Cherish. The custody dispute between the two had lasted years. The current order was that Cherish would spend part of the year with her mother in Florida and part of the year with her father in California. Cherish was actually flying out the next morning to spend the remainder of the summer with him, so sending her with new clothes and new shoes is just what she needed for this vacation with her father. So Rain ultimately decides to take the chance and takes Don up on his offer. He helps her load up her stroller and her bags of goods that she got from the dollar store and she and her three girls get inside his van. On the drive to Walmart, Don has more small talk with Rain. He asks how old her girls are and he tells her that he's 61 years old. He talks more about his job at Habijacks, which is also known as Homes for Humanity. He speaks about his wife saying that she is originally from the Virgin Islands. Rain is still somewhat apprehensive apprehensive about accepting this ride from Don. So he looks her in the eye and says, don't worry, you are safe. 
They arrive at Walmart between 8.30 and 8.45 p.m. As Don parks the van, he takes his phone from his pocket and he begins speaking to what Rain believes is his wife. It's a short discussion and he makes some comment about getting Chinese food. After he gets off the phone, he tells Rain that she is still on the way to Walmart. So they sit and wait in his van for a few minutes for her to arrive. All of a sudden, Don says to Rain, why don't you and your girls go inside and start shopping and I'll meet you in there when she comes. So Rain does just that. She and the girls go inside Walmart and they start picking out items. Rain and her girls are shopping for quite some time before Don meets them inside, but when he comes in, his wife is not with him. Rain asks him where she is and he replies she's still on the way. At first, Don seems content just standing off to the side and watching as they shop, but as the minutes tick by, he becomes more interactive. Out of all the items that one can purchase at Walmart, Don chooses a long rope to buy for himself. Cherish wants to try on some clothes and Rain allows Don to escort her to the dressing room to try them on. He does this two separate times. At one point, Don brings Cherish a pair of high heels to try on. Cherish thinks it's funny and jokingly asks her mom if she can have them. Rain says no, those are women's shoes and she can't wear those. Now they've been shopping for close to an hour and a half and Don's wife never shows. All he would keep saying was that don't worry she's on the way. Now at this point it's around 10 30 p.m. and the girls are getting fussy because they're hungry. Don then says I'm going to McDonald's what do you guys want to eat? Rain and her girls decide on cheeseburgers. The McDonald's he's speaking about is conveniently located right inside the Walmart. Don walks off in the direction of the McDonald's and Cherish follows him. Rain allows her daughter to accompany him for a few different reasons. Her reasoning is that they won't be going very far and they're not leaving the store. Also, this was a guy who's helping her out so she didn't want to offend him by seeming overprotective and calling her daughter back like she didn't trust him. Rain continues looking in the kid's shoe aisle, but after a few minutes an announcement comes over the PA system telling shoppers to take their final purchases to the registers to check out as the store is closing shortly. So Rain and her two girls head to the front of the store, but she doesn't see Cherish and she doesn't see Don. She starts to panic a little and she runs over to the McDonald's, but it's closed. She frantically looks down every checkout lane, every aisle, and cannot find either of them. After several minutes of searching, it's clear that they are not in the store. She runs outside and she can see that Don's white van is now gone. She runs back inside, screaming that a man has just abducted her daughter. She borrows an employee's phone and calls 911. The time is 11.18 p.m. Here is a portion of her 911 call. Jackson, I'm one Robinson. Hi, that Walmart. A winter has been taken. What do you mean? Taken by a stranger. I can't find her. Okay, when was, where did you last see her at? Walmart. I met a man today at Dollar General. He saw that I was struggling to buy them some clothes. He drove us here to buy us some clothes and the only reason I went with him because she said his wife was going to be here because I told him I don't take rides with strangers. I don't remember what clothes she's wearing because I'm panicking right now. I'm trying not to panic. Okay, and she was last seen with this man? Yes, he went. To, he said he was going to McDonald's and he, he hasn't been there because the store is closed right now. Okay, is he a white man or a black man? A white man. He's got white short hair and he's got dark eyebrows. I had a strange feeling about him when I first met him and he took her to the, to, to the dressing room twice. And I was hoping that she would be okay. And I was looking at the shoes. And I didn't want him to think that I was overly protective, freaking out. But now, they're not here. Oh, okay, ma'am. What color vehicle does he drive? It's a white van. I feel like a fool. He said his name is Don. He said he was supposed to meet his wife here. His wife never showed up, and I couldn't figure out why. His wife didn't even show up at Dollar General. I ha had this cart full of clothes that he said he was going to pay for. I had a bad feeling. I thought, well, I feel like pinching myself because this is too good to be true. Now, I'm hoping he's not raping her right now because I've had that done to me. It's not it's not fun. She's supposed to go to California in the morning to <laughs> the plane. And he knows this. I told him this. He knew when the store was closing. <laughs> I had a bad feeling about him. Okay, how long have you been looking for you? When was the last time you saw him? How long ago? About half an hour ago. He said he was going to McDonald's. She went with him. I should have told her to stay with me. He must know that I'm panicking by now. He was, he was, uh, 
He was giving too much attention. He wanted her to buy these really tall shoes that were women's shoes, and I told him no. I said, they're too high for her. I wouldn't even wear shoes that high. Maybe he was grooming her. I hope to God he doesn't kill her, and I hope to God he doesn't rape her. And I don't understand why he would leave her right now unless he's going to rape her and kill her. That's the only reason. <sighs> I don't want him to kill her. I don't want to be one of those parents that are going through this. I feel responsible because I, I, I told him when I first met him that I, that I was a little bit scared of him because I thought he was waiting to rob us outside the Dollar General because he was just standing there. I should have told him no. Uh, my, my, my girls need clothes so bad. Within just a few minutes, police arrive at Walmart to interview Rain and obtain surveillance footage from the store. A bolo, or be on the lookout, is issued for Don and his white van. They comb through the surveillance footage, and it ultimately proves that Don had, in fact, walked out with Cherish. You can see that she follows Don out to his van, gets inside, and the van ultimately drives out of the parking lot. This piece of information is very hard to understand. An Amber Alert is not issued for Cherish until 4.21 a.m. This is almost five hours after she's been taken. A news conference is finally held at 5 a.m., letting the general public know. Why was there such a delay in getting this vital information out? Well, it's believed that police were initially skeptical of Rain's story. Worst yet, they classified this as a missing persons case instead of an abduction. Police speculated that Rain was possibly attempting to hide her daughter so she didn't have to send her to California. I suppose the timing of everything does seem a little suspicious. Police do not classify Cherish's case as an abduction until hours later, and that is when the Amber Alert and news conference is put out. Two witnesses call police to report that they were inside of the Walmart's parking lot waiting for a family member the night before, and they report seeing this white van and having a strange encounter with the driver. They said that Don pulled up alongside their vehicle and said in a proud, giddy sort of manner, we're going to get cheeseburgers, and then Don drives away. Now, they didn't really know what to think of this. They just thought that the guy was a little weird. They had no idea that he had just abducted a little girl. Now, what would possess Don to tell complete strangers this information? Even though Cherish left willingly with Don, she was probably becoming a little frightened being alone with him. She was without her mother and her sisters, and it was late at night. Don most likely said this to continue his ruse so that Cherish would remain calm. It's not known what Don said to Cherish to convince her to leave Walmart with him, but looking at the surveillance footage, you can see that Don and Cherish approached the McDonald's and paused there briefly before walking outside. The McDonald's had just closed and an employee can be seen mopping the floor. Now Don most likely said that there was another McDonald's close by, so let's just go there. Why did Cherish ultimately walk out and leave with him? The answer is really simple. She followed her mother's lead. If her mother trusted him enough to get inside his van with her and her sisters, why wouldn't Cherish trust him? Don had just spent the last couple of hours with the family putting on the appearance of being a real nice guy. He ingratiated himself. And you also have to remember that Cherish was only eight years old. She was completely naive as to what Don had in mind for her. Anyone who might have saw the two of them walk out of Walmart were none the wiser that something sinister was taking place. This did not look like an abduction at all. To them, it looked like a grandfather walking out with his granddaughter. At 8.34 that morning, a good Samaritan named Christina Howard calls 911 stating that she saw a suspicious white van behind the Highland Baptist Church a little earlier that morning. The church was right in Jacksonville, not far from Walmart. She had just heard about Cherish's abduction and that the public should be on the lookout for a white van. So when she saw the white van behind the church, she thought that this information was important. She said that the van was backed up to a tree line, sort of hidden by a bush with the back doors wide open. She didn't see anyone around it though. Within an hour of this 911 call, there was an officer out on a traffic accident. And while taking the information information from the occupants of these vehicles, she sees Don's white van pass her by getting on the highway. So she tells the people, I'll be right back, and she begins to tail him. Now she has to wait for another officer to get nearby as this is considered a felony traffic stop. Once a second officer got in place, they pulled Don over. He is ordered from his van at gunpoint and put into cuffs. They search Don's van, but Cherish is not there. As the officer is searching him, he can feel that Don is soaking wet from his waist down. Almost instantaneously and involuntarily, 
momentarily, the officer says, oh my God, she's in the water. Right after the officer says this, Don, who had been looking straight forward, turns and looks at the officer in a panic and then turns and looks straight forward again. Don would give the police nothing but lies when they asked where Cherish was. He said he had nothing to do with the kidnapping of any child and he was out doing drugs with prostitutes all night. When asked why his pants and his shoes were soaking wet, Don replied, well, when I do drugs, I sweat profusely. It wouldn't take police very long to find Cherish, though, thanks to Christina Howard's 911 call. The same officer who put the cuffs on Donald Smith, named Charlie Wilkie, was sent down to the Highland Baptist Church with his canine partner, Gator, to search the area. Gator picked up on a scent almost immediately. He led Officer Wilkie to a creek that ran behind the church, and in the water underneath a downed tree, he would find Cherish's lifeless body. Don had used nearby concrete rocks and debris to weigh her down. She was still wearing the pretty orange dress with the fruit pattern that she had on the night before. Her long, beautiful hair flowed softly in the water's current. This was not the outcome that anyone had hoped for. What Don did to Cherish in her final hours is so repulsive and so awful that I really have to be careful in the words that I use to describe it because I don't want to get too graphic. I feel it's important though to understand what this monster who paraded around in human skin did to this little girl. Cherish's death was not quick, nor was it painless. This was a prolonged attack. He literally tortured her for hours. There were numerous scratches, bruises, and abrasions on her face and her body. Cherish endured a horrific, violent sexual assault. There was so much swelling and damage to her rectum and her private area that the medical examiner couldn't even recognize them. And this was due to the extensive tearing of the tissues. Don's DNA would be found in both. The medical examiner had to use an anatomy book so she would know what this area looked like normally for a girl her age. Cherish had a large bruise on her left breast. This bruise can also be referred to as a hickey. I don't think I need to explain any further on that one. He gagged her with such force that the gums of her front teeth and her nose bled profusely. Her ultimate cause of death would be mechanical asphyxia. Don choked her so intensely that her eyes actually bled. There was extensive damage to her neck both inside and out. She had blunt force trauma to the back of her head and her brain had swelled. After Don was hauled off to the police station, he refused to speak with police requesting an attorney. Many photos were taken of Don documenting his physical state. Cotton swabs were taken from his private area which later confirmed Cherish's DNA was there. While taking these photos, they discovered that he had a bruise on the top of his penis as well as on the side of it. These bruises could also be classified as hickeys. Like before, I don't think I need to explain any further. I think you can gather what happened. Cherish only weighed 67 pounds and though she tried to defend herself, she was no match for this pedophile. I should shudder at the thought of what her final hours were like. I can only imagine the terror and the pain that she suffered. Here's some information about Donald Smith. For starters, he was a serious drug addict. You won't be surprised to hear that he had been a career criminal and a sexual predator for decades. He had been on the sexual offender registry since 1993. You can actually witness Don growing older through all of the mug shots that have been taken of him over the years. Here are just a few examples of his extensive predatory history. When he was in his 20s, he was caught masturbating in front of two girls, ages 5 and 8. He was sent to prison for five years for that. He was classified at that time as a mentally disordered sexual offender. In 1993, he attempted to abduct a 13-year-old girl. As she was walking home, he walked up on her and started asking her about the school she attended. He kept insisting that he wanted to drive her home. Even a 13-year-old could tell there was something really off about him. She tried to walk away, and that's when he got real nasty with her telling her, get the F in my truck. She ran to a nearby playground and hid in the tunnel of a slide. Don went there searching for her, saying things like, I know you're in there, you little bee. Thankfully, he did not find her. For this crime, he was sentenced to 15 years in prison, but he only served six. He had been ordered to seek treatment for his deviant, predatory behavior, but he never did so. In 2009, he attempted to lure a young girl away from her grandmother. He was impersonating a Florida welfare worker, telling the little girl that he needed to examine her to determine if she had been sexually molested. And for this, he was sentenced to two years in prison, but he only served one. He had been released from prison only 21 days before he abducted and killed Cherish. Why was this habitual offender allowed to roam free with such an extensive history? Why was he given chance after chance to keep reoffending? There are probably plenty of incidents involving young girls over the years that the police aren't even aware of. What about Cherish's mother? She definitely bears some responsibility 
instability in the death of her daughter, her desire to get her children new clothes and shoes outweighed her intuition that something was not right about Don. When Don saw Cherish at the Dollar General with her mother and sisters, he knew instantly that he wanted her, and he was determined to do or say anything he needed to to get Cherish in a vulnerable position. Just by talking to Rain, he could sense that she was someone who could easily be taken advantage of. He knew that getting them to go to Walmart would buy him the time needed so that he could figure out how to get Cherish away from her mother without causing a scene. Rain ignored her gut feeling and allowed Cherish to walk off with a man that she did not know because she didn't want to appear rude or overprotective. She allowed herself to believe that Don was a good guy and Cherish would pay the price for her mother's mistake. I'm sure that Rain feels immense guilt for this and she will live with that guilt for the remainder of her life. I'll post a link to the full surveillance footage at the Dollar General. It's really scary to watch. Once Don saw Rain and her girls, he creepily watches them trying to appear as a regular shopper. He lingers around while keeping a close eye on them. Then he waits outside the door for them to walk out. It's tough watching this knowing what the outcome is. Rain's two other girls were taken from her by child welfare and placed into foster care. She had the chance to get them back, but she did not complete the required tasks that the judge asked of her. She had 12 months to do so, and she couldn't or didn't meet the requirements in time. So the girls were put up for adoption. Rain's family, who all live in Australia, spoke of what a bad mother she is. Not just now, but that she had been for years. When she moved to the United States years ago, she abandoned her firstborn daughter with her own mother. The girl was only five at the time. Rain did not have much, if any at all, contact with her family for years. And it would be this family that petitioned the court to get custody of the girls, and thankfully, they were granted it. The girls were sent to live with them in Australia, where they are happy and safe. Donald Smith was recorded talking to his mother during a prison visit. He reveled at the attention that he and this case were getting in the media. He proudly stated that this case was bigger than Casey Anthony. He asked his mother to get him a book that would detail various mental disorders so that he could convincingly fake a mental illness. He told his mother that he told Cherish not to come with him, but she did so anyway. He said that once she got into his van, it was a done deal. He knew if he was caught with her that he would be facing big prison time. He seemed to blame Cherish for her own death. He said it was either her or him and she had to go. This was his life that she was putting in jeopardy. He claimed that he didn't see young girls as sexual objects. He also would say that he wasn't violent. Then he would pose a question to his mother that he himself would answer. He said, could I have done what the court and the medical examiner said I did? He would answer that question saying probably so twice. He spoke of being fearful of being attacked, raped, or killed by other inmates for his crimes. On another occasion, he was recorded speaking to a fellow inmate, and he was talking about some preteens that had to tour the jail. He gloated that a 12-year-old is his target area. That is what turned him on. He even crudely stated about one of the girls that he saw on this tour. He would say, I'd love to meet her at Walmart. This monster did not feel guilt or shame. There was zero remorse from him for what he did. He sat through hours of court stone-faced, not seeming phased by any of it, and at times he would smile inappropriately. Donald Smith was given the death penalty for what he did to Cherish. He has tried to appeal his death sentence several times over the years, but all of those appeals have been rejected. This was a really hard case to research. It's really hard for me to believe that there are people like him out there. I know there are, but it's just so confronting hearing the details. This case was tragic in every aspect. I want to thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video. I would really love to know what you thought of this case, so please let me know in the comments section. If you have a specific case that you'd like me to cover, please let me know in the comments section. I love to take requests. If you enjoyed this video even just a little bit, please consider subscribing to my channel. I would truly appreciate that. Thank you once again for taking the time to watch this video. And remember, stay safe out there, people.